Oh, hello, Dan. Hello, Dan. Um, I'm going to ask you this, like I haven't just been talking with you for the last 30 minutes. How are you, Dan? <laughs> I'm very well. Oh, that's good. Uh-huh. That's good to hear. Only you know how much of a lie that is. <laughs> Only you know. <laughs> if you can hear the pain behind Dan's voice. Um, well, that's no, good. That's not true. I'm, I'm quite well. Good. Lovely. Excellent. Even. Um, uh, how are your potatoes faring? Oh, uh, I knew this was. I knew this question was coming. Potentially badly. Okay. Here's the thing. Because I got a very excited a, a text message from Jack last week. I'm, I'm planting the potatoes. God damn it! When it was like 20 plus degrees. It was beautiful, and I had nothing I to do. Can't possibly be any more frosts. <laughs> exactly. End of March. They're like wait until April, but you don't probably need to. Main crops. They're hardy. <laughs> Um, it snowed twice in the like seven days since that's happened and it might snow again this coming Sunday, which is awesome. And, uh, if you don't know anything about potatoes, don't like frost. So we'll see, but they are in the ground and the plants have not sprouted yet. So presumably they'll be okay. I'm kind of panicking. Wasn't able to sleep last night, kind of having anxiety attacks for my poor potatoes. Um, do you want any potatoes, by the way? I'm not really selling it. Last week you said yes, so I'm holding you to that. So you're basically committed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was telling you, I did make a new bed. And ah. I, but I've, I've since decided probably what's going to go in is, well, courgettes if they ever, mm. if the seeds ever grow. Sure. Um, and courgette is pe- um, an eggplant? Or no, that's an aubergine. That's an aubergine. Courgette is a zucchini. Zucchini. Okay, oh. there we go. Zucchini. I think you used the word courgette when we were talking. Just yeah, before probably. We <laughs> I just I go I go in and out of knowing which country I'm in. I don't know. You can't happily use both words. You just don't know that they're yeah, exactly. I used the word palava the other day to an American friend, and they're just like, uh, "What?" <laughs> oh, I never really thought about that as a as an example of a particularly British um, piece of phraseology. What, palava. Palava yeah. sounds very British. Said, yeah. In what context did you use the word palaver? Um, just it's a my bit day. Of a it's a bit of a palaver. It's <laughs> how been a is your palaver. life in general, Jack? <laughs> it's a palaver. Jack, how are the potatoes? Oh. <laughs> Don't go there. It's a mighty palaver. Tell you what, though, it's been a long time since we've done Broadbean Watch. Uh, Broadbeans are doing well. I think we can good. say that they're going to be fine. Good. good. Mine got mine got a bit battered by the wind. Oh yeah. Um, Do you have any flowers? No. Oh. Not noticeably. I'm not mm. inspecting them very closely. <laughs> gotcha. Potentially. Maybe I'll go and give them an examination afterwards. I got not. some flowers and they're beautiful. Nice. Really beautiful flowers. Jack's broad beans are a lot healthier than mine. For, yeah, I don't know why. What did you plant? But I think here's my... the thing. At the beginning, yours seemed like they were going to be like... Yeah. Because you planted them in warm, like a bed. and like. Yeah, but ours were probably more protected from the elements, but mm. yours have better access to sunlight. Oh, sure. And I think also ours may have got eaten by some pests more than yours. Mm. My, as might have been a bit more blighted by the, um, mm. the slugs. The slugs. Yeah, I did cover mine because I figured some slugs were coming and then they got to like six inches tall and I was just like, all right, whatever's going to happen is going to happen and I took it off. Mm-hmm. So they're and, fine. Um, yeah, mine have because I because they, they're in partial shade and also because I kept building up this sort of like this wood around them on which to support the window. Oh, sure. Oh, making they've it all, taller and all, taller. Yeah, quite. Yeah, so they've all gotten very kind of like wasted or put a lot of energy into growing. Mm. So they're longer and they're a bit leggy and they sort of like bend and weave and <laughs> are all over the place a bit. I will say... So they're not going to win any beauty contests. But, uh, but will the beans be high su- hopes. sustenance filled? high hopes. If, if there's ever a plant that you can just go, all right, you're, you're big boys, you can deal with it. It's the broad bean. The broad <laughs> bean is just like, it'll, it can take whatever you throw at it. Mine were covered in like a foot of snow for like two days <laughs> and they're fine they'll be okay it's a broad bean we've learned <laughs> <laughs> what did you learn from this week's podcast <laughs> all about the broad bean i don't even know if i like broad beans quite frankly i've had i mean i've never ordered a broad bean presumably because they're always called fava beans uh-huh. but like that is just a big bean as an abac it's a very big bean yeah <laughs> yeah I mean, they're not my favorites. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of them come, I don't know, 11 months. I don't know how long does it take a guy I mean, to yeah, to show yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. No, it's July, right? 18 months later. God, jeez. Tell you what, too many beans. That's going to be the motto of the podcast soon. Too many beans. Well, I hope so. Um, anything else, Scott Grun? Um, I was telling you some of the leaks, actually. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, emerge, yeah. Tiny little, tiny little, tiny little, little leaks. It is funny that they are just little leaks when they spring tiny up. It's just guys. like, oh. yeah, they almost look like they have a little like loop. Yeah, I think they're gonna kind of like. Yeah, they like spring up. up. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Which makes them identifiable. I'm not going to accidentally weed them. Yeah, I know. Same. I think I might have actually accidentally done that a couple of them. I get very, like, I don't want any weeds in, like, the seeds that are propagating, or in the soil that's propagating my seeds. And I, like, just very, like, gung-ho, pluck everything out. And then I go, ah, oh, that was a squash. <laughs> <laughs> Happened to me the other day. Um, radishes do very well. Mm. Some lettuces finally showed up. Oh, really? Did you sow the lettuce outside? Yes. Okay. Undercover, just about. Gotcha. Mm, as, best as, as best as I can manage. <laughs> Done my best. Still quite a lot of things inside not showing up at all. Mm. Still no tomatoes. Yeah. Still no um, zucchini. Ah, uh, zucchini. Is that a courgette? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you start with me. <laughs> um all right, well, garden talk. That's good. Uh-huh. Um, All right, we've done it. Take that one off. Yeah, yeah. Take the garden we'll talk off. The um, Everybody will be pleased. Everyone will be pleased Everybody to hear us talk about knows beans. Which podcast are listening to? <laughs> yeah, it's that one. It's that one. It's, that one. <laughs> it's the one that starts they've off the same. They've talked about week. the gardening, and <laughs> by virtue of the fact that they've talked about the gardening, they by proxy talked about the weather. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know what? Here's here's a way to make it better when we talk about this. Each week, let's have a tip. A tip from the garden. My tip is don't just voraciously un, uh, uh, weed everything that's in the soil that you're propagating seeds because most likely you're plucking out the things that you're trying to grow. And also remember where you grew stuff because now that all my onions are coming up, I'm like, who planted these? They're like three <laughs> right next to each other and then like one in the middle. It's just like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, plant them in rows. Yeah. Put little like markers at the end. I can't be bothered. Yeah. Yours is very like haphazard. <laughs> it's it. avant garde. It's avant garde onions. <laughs> Indeed. Mm, I don't know if I have a gardening tip. I was trying to, about a year ago, I built a compost bin. Mm. And over this weekend, I finally got around to trying to finish it by building a lid. Oh, okay. And um, the mistake I made was I immediately <laughs> attached the hinges and then attempted mm. to start constructing a lid. From the hinges from, out. Oh, interesting. Um, which I think, after giving it secondary consideration, was necessary based on the fact that nothing about the compost bin, like none of the edges, are, none of the sides of the bin are particularly like <laughs> perpendicular to any other. <laughs> sure. Um, and if I had attempted to use any other methodology, I probably would have had to like measure first oh. and have some kind of plan. Yeah, it's and like I'm, planting I'm totally seeds. Totally averse to that. Yeah, exactly. I just want to sort of like start go screwing bits together. <laughs> Um, our forefathers did but it. i think probably a good tip which i probably won't follow in future is <laughs> if you're trying to build anything hinged build the entirety of the thing you want to hinge then attach it to then the thing it. that it's going to be attached to that makes sense but i'm not going to so you just but basically like... because basically because in my attempts to <laughs> complete the construction i'm putting a lot of strain on the hinges and oh, so sure. like there are a lot of the, the a lot of the screws which are not particularly well put in because i'm also terrible at driving screws and <laughs> sort of mangle screw heads one after another the tip is just go for it i think both of our tips can be summarized as just go for it yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, cut first, measure afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Have a what is it you say? Have a have a point. Have a po oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, that's that's something different. That's something. Different. Oh sure, sure. Yeah. Well, when you're done, you just kind of sit there and go, oh, "Look at that! I should have done this." There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> My dad would say, um, he would say that he was um, considering the situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Assessing the situation. Assessing the situation. <laughs> I love that. Um, that's true. He would say assessing. How did you? There say you go. I know your father. The situation. <laughs> Um, and then a friend of mine told me that in her family, their version of that is having a point. Having a point. Where I all love having a point. <laughs> blokes stand back from <laughs> the thing that they're tempted to work on and sort of point at problematic <laughs> areas and go, ooh, I don't know about that. Uh, yes, <laughs> shouldn't have put the hinges yeah. on first. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Having a point. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Mm. So it's, um, yeah, we, yeah. I um, advocate the activity of having a point, but not... <laughs> But I, by which I don't mean having intention to your action. Sure. Yeah. All right. Don't tip. act intentionally, but in hindsight, <laughs> scrutinize. Yeah, exactly. With the, with the tip of a finger. Be proud by the end of it. No matter what happens, just be proud of it. Um, I'll tell you what, Dan. Uh -huh. Should talking we of um, talking strategy. And strategy. Ah, oh, <laughs> yeah, and beans. Um, should we have a point? Talking about knowing what you're doing. The last point that we will ever take what am I saying? The last time, <laughs> this is the last time that we'll ever read a chapter from the book that started it all, Dan. What are we doing? We're, we are 
the final chapter. The final goddamn the final chapter. Final chapter. Ralph Miliband's Marxism <laughs> and Politics. The uh, the subject matter for our first episode. Here we are, episode twenty five, <laughs> finishing off this, as we often say, <laughs> Two, short introductory book. Two hundred page book. <laughs> it is literally. I was thinking about this last night. It has taken us over six months. Yeah. It's taken us over half a year to finish this book. Yeah. Let that be a testament, though. The book's good and dense. Well, maybe not dense, but it's filled with information. Yeah. 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 You have to let it sink in. Mm, mm. Um, I mean, I suppose any normal person would have just read it as entirely probably. <laughs> once they but then they would have talked about like two things. Bless us. That's Quite. what I say. Yeah, yeah, Bless yeah, our yeah. socks. Um, so here we are, the final chapter. Chapter five. five? <laughs> um, 55. Because that's a bit. <laughs> Yeah. Our confusion as to what the chapters are. Six. Book. Six. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just sworn it was five. Wow, that's weird. That's commitment to the bit, folks. Commitment to the bit, yeah. Or I'm an idiot. Uh, <laughs> the subject matter of which is reform and revolution. Mm. Um, a, that- a, a dichotomy which he very quickly discounts. He does. I will say <laughs> and- it is it is reform and revolution, not reform or revolution. Did I say and or? I think you said and. Uh, okay. So yes. wait, what is it? <laughs> reform and it's revolution. And. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> reform and revolution. Yeah. Um, very good, as always. Um, mm-hmm. Our patron saint, Ralph Miliband, mm-hmm. he did a bang up job. I think we can say that. Um, I think, yeah, I don't know. I think the first thing, like you're saying, the first thing that he just gets into is that reforms and revolution are not mutually exclusive. They're not incompatible and you can pursue uh, reforms in the interest of the working class without being a, like, anti-revolutionary bourgeoisie scumbag, right? Yes, and I mean, point. it was good to just have someone come out and be like, hey, you can't do both. Yeah, Because yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. that debate is just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in this chapter, you almost get a sense of him actually telling you how it is. It's true. Because for the most yeah. part, most of what he does is, like, lay it throughout the book anyway, sort of, lay out all of the debates it's a lay of the land kind Mm, of book indeed um and he almost seems to come down on the side of certain things in this chapter he does he sort of pulls back from it a little bit as well he's (laughs) kind of like cautious and tentative um but we get to see a little bit of um, Mm. behind the veil behind the veil what does ralph think what does ralph actually think um but uh, yeah you're you're right we uh, the, the um the the chapter starts with uh with a quote from Engels. Marx's funeral, where he refers to Marx mm. as a revolutionist, mm. Mm. Um, and uh, Miliband goes on to sort of expand that idea a little bit, and basically to say that like the crux of a Marxist politics is always aimed at the revolutionary transformation of sure. the state, kind mm. of thing. Mm. Um, and so, in ultimate aim, or the ultimate aim, I suppose, is a revolutionary one. Sure. In both instances. And it's one of the reasons that problematizes this distinction, right? Like, mm. um, reform and revolution not really covering very well the breadth of the debate. They're not good pieces of terminology to apply to both sides of this mm. distinction, which is a true and real one kind of thing. Mm. Um, and basically, this chapter is all focused on a question of strategy, really. Yeah. How is that uh, revolutionary as- aspiration? How is that uh, fundamental transition or transformation of uh, the mode of production into a new socialist one mm. um, to be achieved? Mm. Um, and so, yeah, it sort of makes this distinction, which I'm trying to draw between purpose and strategy. Right? Like sure. The Marxist purpose is... Mm. Like, is revolution in both cases, but in sort of mm. from, from the standpoint of strategy, like a game theory um, kind of aspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That you sort of the the sort of like history of Marxist thought and Marxist strategy has sort of fall fallen into these two broadish camps. Although he does introduce a whole other, a load of others, and then he also the, so there's there's the kind of the idea of revolution problematized, right? Like it could actually apply to both sides of this debate, and then also in some effort to sort of problematize reform, um, he also points out that. It's entirely possible to have like what he calls social reform or social reformism, sure. which isn't Marxist, mm. um, which doesn't actually have any of that sort of like yeah. revolutionary aspiration. Mm. Um, you could be like a conservative social reformer kind of thing, sure. of which there are many. Mm. I mean, of, of which the history of capitalism is full of like sure. people whose aspiration is to like improve people's conditions, perhaps, but without those. Um, sort of like those elements of reform 
leading to or resulting in any sort of fundamental transformation, I suppose. Yeah, I think a lot of the times, um, <clears throat> like, reformism, just as a phrase, kind of gets um, misconstrued as entryism of one kind or another. Yeah. And, like, the Rosa Luxemburg essay kind of gets memed on by just being like, well, of course you got to have a revolution. Like, duh, how are you just going to, like, reform your way out of everything? When Miliband here is kind of saying that that's, like, not really the question and that you can have, like, kind of like a kind of Marxist reformism. Because, like, what he's saying, and this was really refreshing, because, like, I get very frustrated with that, like, you know, well, you're not going to have a revolution. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn's not going to have a revolution, something like that, right? Like, obviously, to a certain extent, that's true. But it's also, like, A, not a bad thing to do something in the working class's interest. But B, it's, like, when the question gets bought down to, like, just reform or just revolution, you're kind of miss missing the entire point. Because Miliband here basically says you know, there's nothing wrong with putting, like, all of your energy in, like, as many different uh, arenas of class struggle as, like, as possible, right? So, like, uh, whether that's parliamentary, more parliamentarism, parliament, I can never say that, or whether that's just, like, activism or something like that, or whether it's trade unionism, it's basically saying it's, like, I don't know if he was saying that, like, it's never going to come like, the revolution is never going to come from a sustained push of just one of those angles, but he's like, there's nothing wrong with, like, using, like, as much working class energy as you can, like, in as many arenas as possible. And parliamentaryism is one of those, right? And it's not one that you should just kind of do away with as being, like, I don't want to deal with the bourgeoisie. Like, it's much more complicated than that, is I think what he's saying. Sure, yeah, and it's definitely... Um, well, one of the problems is, like, <laughs> I suppose with any debate... Um, in sort of like Marxist political thought, mm -hmm. you can look at any theorist and find two different quotes that back up sure. two different yeah, lines. Exactly, right? exactly. Um, so there are many places where you sort of um, Marx's own strategy was clearly like one of reform, one of um, clearly, as you say, like engaging in a strategy of participating in. Uh, bourgeois elections i suppose or elections mm. to sort of parliaments in capitalist or bourgeois systems um but also it would be fair to say that um parliamentarism isn't necessarily the only type of re place where sure. a reformist strategy can also be applied kind exactly. of thing he suggests that there are, are ways in which um this strategy which sort of broadly encapsulated by the concept of reformism also applies to ho all sorts of other areas mm. um you could have like a a, a a strategy of um strike action wouldn't necessarily be incompatible with this sort of reformist outlook sure. a strategy of uh, <clears throat> protest or sit-in or mm. civil disobedience wouldn't necessarily be incompatible with any of these ideas I mean, yeah, like, they've all got their own problems, too, obviously. Like, you know, like, talk about getting misconstrued, like, Lenin getting misconstrued, the, like, the working class can only develop trade union consciousness if left to its own, and also, like, Lenin getting misconstrued as, like, never participate in any kind of, like, bourgeois election. Like, I, yeah, not that this really matters, but it's, like, that's not what Lenin was saying at all, but it's also, like, you are going to find problems with, like, any strategy, really, and that's kind of, like, the point of, like, advancing the class struggle and the working class interest along as many fronts as possible, I suppose, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's important that you bring up Lenin there because another aspect of this debate, which um, Lenin's trajectory on these ideas really highlights, mm. is, and it also reinforces the idea that this is a question of strategy, right? Like, his outlook shifted as sort of history and circumstances develop. Sure. Um, and so it really is a question of like what things are tried at what historic junctures under what specific circumstances. Mm. Um, it's, it's the sort of seems to be the primary dic thing which dictates um, what particular route is chosen by. Mm people but also like collectives of people like political parties or what have you kind of mm, mm. um at different points in time mm. yeah yeah right and i mean <clears throat> the obviously big questions come from like a phrase of yeah, the, what you're circling right now marxist reform marxist <laughs> reformism i mean like it brings up the big questions of like uh okay if this is what we want to do if you know some kind of like working class movement is trying to take power and use the like state 
for its own purposes. It's like, is that even possible at all? Um, and what would you do if you were to somehow conceivably get that power? Because with the first question, it's like, would anyone let you get that power? Would someone as moderate as Bernie Sanders be allowed anywhere like close to the presidency? Um, what would the ruling classes do to stop some sort of reformist government from taking place? And then if they did, what would you be able to do? Because you have to deal with the state, kind of like bureaucracy. You got to deal with all the administrators. Not to say anything of like the reactionaries, like conservatives. Um, and yeah, I mean, all very big questions. And he seems to point like, right, to like Allende as kind of like one big example of uh, to what lengths will the ruling class go to once a reformist government is in power to stifle it. Uh, quite extreme ones turned out to be the answer. And I forget exactly what year this book was written, sometime in the 70s, right? But um, <laughs> that was still fresh in everybody's mind. Yeah, 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 I think it was 77 or something. Yeah. There was something about the way he phrased it, which made me have to look up. Is it? Is he writing this between Allende's first ele Allende's oh, yeah. election and the coup? <laughs> oh, something? God. Um, He's like, see, it'll work out fine. <laughs> <laughs> because, like, yeah, if Allende were to be his sort of primary example of what <laughs> oh, a God. sort of like um, contemporary, contemporary to him anyway, yeah, um, Marxist reformist strategy, mm. um, which could plausibly result in a revolutionary transformation, if that were his example, <laughs> it's, example. it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> he's like, see, America doesn't care about copper mines. <laughs> There was one point, too, where I kind of misunderstood what he was saying, where he said something like, I think the idea now that um, America as like the great conservative savior of stopping any kind of left wing government anywhere around the world has gone out of fashion. And I was like, has it? But then he clarified it to basically say, because even like nominally left wing governments in like Germany would try and stop like a reformist government from taking power. And I was like, oh, OK, yeah, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> I was like, geez. <laughs> yeah yeah he's kind of talking about western europe there isn't he yeah. like america has withdrawn from the requirement to discipline yeah. uh, the parties of western europe because the parties of western europe are perfectly capable of disciplining themselves <laughs> uh yeah he brought up france too it's like the what it's swasson swasson weeders or something like that the 68ers mm -hmm. um and yeah oof boy just as like a party that was could have taken this like it was reformist and then it had this opportunity to like maybe be revolutionary and then, eh, We'd rather not. Thank you very much. <laughs> France. Too risky. Yeah, oh, France. Too risky. There's never been a successful revolution in France. Get out of here. Um, God knows they've tried. God knows they have tried. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, so I suppose like what we what we haven't yet done is explain Ralph Miliband's alternate mm, dichotomy. If not sure. reform and revolution, the, the sort of terminology he settles on is a distinction between like constitutionalism as opposed to mm. insurrection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And basically what is... He's, he's suggesting that, like, um, so you can have, a, as we've said, you can have a Marxist um, form of reformism, which is different from the social reformers who, for whom, like, um, the reform is the, the ultimate aim is those reforms. And mm. it's sort of quite happy to stop that kind of thing. Whereas the Marxist revolutionaries, revolu <laughs> <laughs> whereas the Marxist reformers um, are ha quite happy to engage in efforts toward reform to towards improving social conditions for the working class um without having reform be the ultimate aim kind of thing mm. um and he sort of distinguishes marxist reformism from gradualism which would be that strategy of like mm. um believing that reforms in and of themselves will lead to a um sort of like progressive trajectory for um, a capitalist state to mature into a socialist sure. one without there having to be any actual conflict involved. Yeah. Um, and I was quite interested in a, sort of a little aside he makes where he uh, highlights the British Fabian movement oh, yeah. as being yeah. um, an example of gradualism. Mm. And then he sort of, he suggests, he, he highlights this t period of time in the 30s where the Fabians were actually particularly enamored with the Soviet Union because mm. yeah. they sort of thought that the Soviet Union might be, rep might represent this kind of like uh, form of gradualism in, by which they mean um, uh, a transition to socialism, which was sort of almost dictated from on high kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess for the Fabians in Britain, there was also this aspect of uh, winning over 
um, member people from other classes to the idea of the sort of like progressive benefits of a transition to socialism, which did not include any like, uh, which did not include any necessary um, requirement or uh, theoretical attachment to the idea of conflict. Right? Yeah, there would yeah. there was no requirement for conflict in the gradual sort of like gradualist model of transition. Um, whereas it's worth pointing out, making reference, I guess, to the very first chapter of this book and also to the very first episode, even uh, if you are a Marxist reformer, you still strongly believe in uh, conflict and struggle as being the basis of a politics kind of thing. Sure. Um, but for the reformers, for what Miliband would call the constitutionalists, I suppose those people who want to engage in this process of transformation of the state but still within the constitutional bounds within the legal bounds within the uh constitutional framework of the state um that conflict is all to happen within the bounds of the the state i suppose they'll just let it happen yeah <laughs> i like how he, he really made the point like not only should we not think of the Fabians as Marxists, he was like, they were like loud and clear. We are not we are Marxists, not. Yeah, 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 you guys. Yeah, yeah. That is not yeah, yeah, who we yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What what is what are the Fabians? What are they up to these days? Are they like even worth like do they have a say in anything? In any um, policy or anything? They certainly exist. Okay. <laughs> and um I think probably their ultimate irrelevance <laughs> is probably spoken to by the fact that I would imagine, or I understand it to be the case that basically every Labour MP is a, is a member of the F okay, Fabian gotcha. subset of Labour <laughs> MPs, right? Gotcha. <laughs> If they're all Fabians, then I yeah. don't think it matters. There are any of them really Fabians. <laughs> I don't think it matters. Um, but that, I, I, to, be actual, to be entirely honest, I actually don't know enough about them yeah. kind well, of thing. <laughs> presumably they uh, don't have a whole lot going uh -huh, for them uh -huh. but bless but, them. Uh, but it, it is interesting also in this book there are a few places where Miliband kind of casts the British Labour Party as being mm. entirely in the sort of social reform category mm -hmm. um, I mean we know that like the British Labour Party doesn't isn't it doesn't become the primary representatives of the working class, the nominal left in Britain in the same way that social democratic parties across Europe come to be sure. representatives of that same sort of electoral coalition. Um, the European social democratic parties do come out of this Marxist tradition in a way that the British Labour Party mm. never really had any connection to. Yeah, it makes me think... Marxist tradition. Yeah, it makes me think of um, episode two, right? Where they started off that interview with Corbyn by basically being like Ralph Miliband never thought the Labour Party would be a vehicle for revolution. Yeah. And it's in, I mean, this clarified it a lot because it, he, you know, he's making that distinction between like the, just these different types of parties and like ones that were born in the Marxist tradition and whatnot. But I thought that was interesting because I was kind of like, as we first started this book, I was like, oh, I'm interested to kind of see where that line of thought comes from. Mm -hmm. And we got to it right, in the, right at the end. Um, yeah, I mean, going off of that, uh, it is it is interesting, like, of course, I feel like we should bring up, too, just the idea of if one of these parties were to come to power, a party that is nominally for the working class and, like, a Marxist reformist party, like, to what extent working within the state, the capitalist state, will they not just wind up becoming the party of order, right? Like, when you're in power, you need to stay in power, and to stay in power, you presumably have to keep power, and to keep power, you have to maintain order. And so, you know, you just get stuck in this, like, because, I mean, you know, Obviously, no true party is ever really going to come to power and be able to put through what it needs to put through without support from other parts of society, right? Whether that be from trade unions, whether that be from just, like, people, you, you know, anything, really. Like, it's going to need to be, there's going to need to obviously be a pace of support that's independent, kind of, of, I'm not going to say of politics, but of, like, that vein of, like, parliamentarianism. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it does just leave you with this, like, taste in your mouth of, like, that second question that he poses of like, okay, you took power, now what? Yeah. Like, is there like, okay, good job. <laughs> if this isn't backed up with anything in society, then like, what are you going to do? Not even thinking about the conflict that's going to happen. Just thinking about the party keeping itself in power. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He, he really, um, he goes after Engels at one point, doesn't he? <laughs> Engels, 
had developed in later life this degree of sanguinity toward the prospects of the German Social Democrats, basically saying that, like, give us 20 years and the Social Democrats <laughs> will represent, like, 75% of the German population just by uh, virtue of the trajectory they're currently on kind of thing. What did just expand the Social <laughs> Democrats? I forget. After those guys. I don't know. Um, Angela Merkel. But, uh, <laughs> but, yeah, obviously... Um, but, yeah, yeah uh, <laughs> Miliband makes the point that... Um, Engels is being incredibly naive <laughs> if he doesn't think that by by virtue of the fact that you're expanding your electoral coalition, it's not going to result in a necessary sort of like diluting of your uh, mm. political aspirations or your yeah. revolutionary aspirations in that broader sense of like mm. the desire to transform the society kind of thing. Mm. Um, and clearly we saw this sort of like process whereby social democratic and ostensibly Marxist parties that would have fit into this reformist Marxist tradition drift over time towards being, as you say, um, not just parties who are seeking to make the transition within constitutional bounds, but sort mm. of like as the ultimate defenders of the constitutional order. Yeah. Particularly when sort of more... Um, in more heated political circumstances, should we say, <laughs> when certain of their former allies decided to take more, um, take on a more insurrectionary strategy. Sure. Um, yeah. They were that they, they were almost like driven to be the ultimate defenders of the present system. Mm. Um, and in a lot of cases, uh, the same same is true of what you were saying about. Um, circumstances in 68 in france right mm. like the you get to the circumstance whereby the ostensibly um revolutionary party or at least the 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 marx the ostensibly marxist party it's more interested in maintaining the status quo than it is with allying itself with social forces which have sort of like have some kind of revolutionary aspiration kind of thing i wonder i wonder what they're thinking in that in that in, in those circumstances if it's just like not now, Rosa Luxemburg, not now, you guys. It, we're, we're almost there. We're so close. Or if it's just like, you know, now is not the time. Or if it's just gotten a whiff of power and like, oh, that's pretty good. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I've always wondered what, in those people's heads, like what actually is, because it, presumably it's got to be right. Like they think that they can do better than yeah. some, you know, children running well, around I think, in yeah, I th yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it is a question of, I mean, it, if if we're not to either to call into question these people's mm, like sure. um, moral character moral character <laughs> quite, I was about to say moral standing but yes <laughs> we're not going to call if we're not going to decide that the fault lies purely in these people and their moral character yeah uh, nor within the degree to which they've become enamored with being <laughs> yeah. like people with power and influence uh, um, just a funny then I, I i suppose i suppose the the sort of like the more friendly interpretation would be to say that um one of these forms of strategy conflicts with the other one, right? Mm. Like the, the, so, the social Democrats interpreted this sort of like the adventurism in air quotes of the insurrectionary wing of mm. uh, international communism mm. um, as being basically a threat to the, the possibility of their strategy functioning kind of thing. But at the same time, who doesn't love an adventure? <laughs> so, that's why I question their moral character. <laughs> <laughs> how did you feel about the idea of um do you do you consider yourself to be a uh, insurrectionary <laughs> i don't know why not sure i mean i like an adventure if that's what you're asking was 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 free here i'll answer your question with another question was frodo an insurrectionary <laughs> <laughs> i mean i don't know i obviously it, it's gonna require quite a bit of conflict right to mm. actually make large meaningful long-term radical changes if we ever want to see anything like an actual socialist society but at the same time it's not like i feel like you can't come down one way or the other immediately because it's like okay well what are your circumstances you know what i mean it's like the thought of an insurrection in the united states is like i feel like is somebody in the german social democratic party just laughing you know what yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. but it's like i don't know in say um a much smaller country um where i don't know circumstances are just different yeah i mean insurrection once you have a popular enough of a base of support i mean it's always going to come down to some kind of insurrection right? yeah no yeah, one's yeah. ever just going to go all right whatever just let the commies do what they're yeah, going to yeah, do yeah, yeah. so i don't know yeah i mean i guess the the 
I mean, Marx's distinction was probably correct in that, like, mm. revolutionary strategies perhaps apply to countries whereby there is no other option, whereby mm. the 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 current structure is a dictatorial a dictatorial one or a mm. um, monarchical one. Yeah, I mean, at heart, you, everyone should be an insurrectionary, though, right? Because our surrounding circumstances are so clearly based on evil that it's like, if this were a perfect world, everyone would be doing everything that they could to topple uh, the capitalist state, yeah, yeah, yeah social yeah, yeah. structures, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. that's just not the world we live in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah. It's, yeah, a bummer. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. Yeah, I found this distinction between um, being constitutional and being insurrectionary is... It's quite an interesting one, actually, and it sort of pro- it, it promotes quite a lot of tactical questions. I suppose it's worth saying that, like, from my very limited understanding of the writings of Mike McNair, mm. um, it's probably worth saying that, like, constitution in this circumstance doesn't seem to have the same meaning as it perhaps does for McNair. Mm. Um, mm. In that, like, from my understanding, like, he would advocate, like, um acting uh, within the bounds which in this in this in Miliband's description would probably fall under the description of being a marxist reformer mm. or a reformist marxist um but he would advocate always sort of like propagandizing for and setting yourself up as being um and yeah activists and a party which is opposed to the current constitutional settlement Mm. even if under normal circumstances you're not going to be outwardly like adventurist i suppose sure Um, (laughs) and i suppose it's it's, i mean it's worth pointing out that like although in this book in a certain period of time i.e between like maybe 1914 and 1920 or even 1914 and his death in 19 24 or maybe a smaller sp- window of time really between 1918 and 1920 like the primary name that's attached to this revolution the insurrectionary strategy is lenin's sure um even lenin isn't like advocating that you can um the phrase Miliband says is Lenin isn't saying that you can make revolution purely by will or proclamation kind of mm-hmm. thing. You can't just like take up your guns and sort of like <laughs> force the circumstances to be right for this insurrection to take place kind of thing. Mm. Um, it's not a strategy for everywhere and under all circumstances. Everybody must like go to the hills and form a guerrilla <laughs> or guerrilla insurgency kind of thing. To the hills. <laughs> If it was, we might be up. Oh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, we might be up in the woods. <laughs> we like the woods. <laughs> we love the woods, folks. So oh, I've got a very off track. Uh... <laughs> well, let me just say on that before we get back on track. Let me just say too that like we've said this on the show before, but this the idea of like insurrectionism as it applies to Leninism. Um, Lenin, more so than anybody, would be the first to tell you this was you know, the time and the space that we were dealing with right now. So don't, you know, go out on Twitter and call yourself an ML and act like you know what you're doing. And we just need to <laughs> do what they did in effing Russia and uh, in the United States, because yeah. that would be a, uh, I don't maybe. I think, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I, cool. I, I, I think that's a vitally important point. <laughs> and um, a point that I hope um, fits in very well with sort of the outlook and theme of this podcast, which mm. is like, mm. don't take, historically contingent strategies and make them universal kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The auxiliary um, statement, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which it feels like very much we know what... It feels like, it feels like looking over history and looking at um, the sort of positions taken by various um, Leninist parties is that's exactly what they did for the most part. You know? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Um, the same is true of like something like democratic centralism or whatever like sure. taking a sort of like mm. a piece of strategy designed for a particular period of time and um, and uh, applied it universally mm. I mean that said like Miliband is very harsh on Lenin in yes <laughs> yeah. honestly I'm here, I'm here for it yeah. I'm okay with it <laughs> I'm all about being harsh on Lenin sorry guys but like yeah why not go yeah, for it yeah. go nuts Miliband go off I mean, I mean, I guess the 
fair. I mean, the, the, I mean, I guess the, the, I mean, the crux of his criticism is that like Lenin was basically wrong. <laughs> <laughs> As should the crux of any criticism be, I suppose, of anyone. <laughs> they are wrong. That is very true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was a sub a subheading in this chapter that said Leninism, and he just said wrong. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. <laughs> Enough said. Um. Basically, on the grounds that, like, he totally misjudged the sort of like um, the mood, yeah, the mood, <laughs> <laughs> the, the 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 sort of the just just the a- applicability of this this um, mm. insurrectionary strategy to all, sure. um, basically all all conditions across Europe, kind of thing. But I mean, coming back to the idea, he's not trying to. He's not suggesting that like you can force a revolutionary conjunction or uh, a revolutionary moment purely by will but he's suggesting in 1918 or that kind of period of time that like conditions are ripe and Mm. uh, everybody should should be preparing Mm. to seize the state via revolutionary means or via insurrectionary means start Um, your chicken tractors now folks (laughs) (laughs) and basically seems to like force this massive rift I mean, the rift was already there, right? You could mm. say that the, the split between the Social Democrats and the and the Leninists, I suppose, you could say that it has its genesis in the conditions of the outbreak of the First World War. Sure. So it might be unfair to to blame Lenin entirely, but Lenin is, Leninism and the tactic of insurrection, which is basically synonymous now in this book with with Leninism, um, clearly does a lot to deepen that rift massively mm. yeah sure. uh, and it contributes to what we were saying before when we were saying that like the social democrats came to find themselves uh, see themselves as defenders of the order in the social order they would def- as we know happened in germany they mm. were defending the social order from the leninists kind yeah of. yeah um mm. so in a lot of ways it just sort of deepened that did you just call rosa luxemburg a leninist <laughs> <laughs> oh um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, again, I guess it, what you're, what I'm kind of getting from what you're saying is it all kind of just does come back to those questions, right? Of okay, you got power now, what do you do? But even like, how would you get power? And the like, how can you it, going back to the game theory? Like, how can you shore up your strategies so that when you do, if you do take power, who's you? What are you taking power of? And what will you do with the one modicum of power you're allowed to have? Yeah. What one bit I did I did find really interesting in this reading was when he was kind of like emphasizing the capacity of capitalism. Um, to bounce back from, like, not defeat, obviously, but from, like, intense economic strain and from challenges, right? Um, And it was interesting because he framed this in a way I hadn't really heard. Obviously, he said that capitalism in just, like, moments of absolute crisis can just go fucking fascism, you know, and just do that and just completely uh, go that route of things. But it's interesting because on the other end of the spectrum, he kind of said it can kind of, like, rebrand itself as having, like, a rebirth, right? And he brought up the example of um, the New Deal under FDR as this, like, guys, we've revitalized ourselves after this complete economic collapse that, oh, who caused that? I'm not sure who caused that. Mm-hmm. Let's not worry about who caused it or what caused it. But, you know, it was very much framed as this, like, revitalization. And even more than that, like, a new thing. It was, like, new capitalism, you know what I mean? And it was, like, by the people for the people, baby. And it was able to, you know, the, I suppose, just, like, New Deal apparatus was able to remain in place for so long Although I wonder saying that if in history books written in like 50 years, if they'll say it would remain in place for very long at all. Remain in place for at least several decades um, just by virtue of kind of like this trust that people had in, you know. I mean, you know, if you were to, if you were to go from like working class standard of standards of living at the beginning of the 20th century, they did improve quite a bit, you know, as for like anybody alive 100 years before that or anything like that. So it's understandable to be like, hey. This capitalism thing, all right, we can deal with it, at least for now. And then, you know, come, like, the next couple of decades after that, leading up to the New Deal when things kind of fell apart, um, people were looking for new answers. There was obviously a bit of a red scare, kind of a little bit before that, but um, people were definitely looking for answers. And an answer was given to them in the form of this, like, new capitalism, baby, the New Deal. And what do you know? We're once again in a moment of crisis where everyone's kind of, like, looking for something new. Um, but yeah, anyway, just getting back to what Milliband said, I did I did really appreciate like that kind of framing as capitalism is a lot like stronger than you might think it is, and it's it's able to uh flex much more than you might think. Um so we'll see what it flexes towards, you know, soon, but mm-hmm. it's a point very well made, I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean I suppose it's also worth looking toward 
I mean, those circumstances of like, um, I mean, I think, I think, think like the the New Deal, um, obviously before the Second World War. Mm. I'm right. Mm. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like, um, the the sort of like post-war boom that did so much to ameliorate, um, and reduce like radical working class aspiration i suppose mm. was aided very much by very favorable economic circumstances as well sure. um so i would hesitate to say that it was entirely like something that happened in the mm. in the brains of the working class that they were sure. sort of, but yeah, that, yeah. that aside right like i mean uh, it was all like yeah i mean I, I should clarify too like it was also like quite a lot of it did have to do with the policies of like you know hey what do i always give people jobs they might like that yeah, they yeah, might yeah, stop yeah. picketing in yeah, dc yeah, god yeah. damn it yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And uh, and also incredibly sort of like exploitative relationships. Sure. Oh, absolutely. No one's no one's being no one's out here being pro FDR. You know? <laughs> um, but yeah, certainly one of the things that contributed to an undermining of a sort of insurrectionary strategy being taken up by the international revolutionary movement, I suppose, was quite how resilient the capitalism was, mm. and also quite how like how much keener it would seem the the working class were on political strategies which revolve around being constitutional sure um no matter what ha- like no matter no matter what happened in that period of history like the working cl- the majority of the working class didn't waver in their support for mm. the social democratic parties mm. there wasn't this massive influx of support from the sort of like the second international political parties toward the new third international ones. Leninism as a strategy was like, <laughs> it was, it was, it never got off the starting block, shall we say. Mm. Like um, the, the, even when Lenin was beginning to sort of like really firm up what it meant to be a sort of like third international political party and what it meant to follow sort of like an insurrectionary political strategy, that political strategy was already moribund by the time he'd articulated it, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Uh, Miliband basically <laughs> describes it as a kind of like preparing for battle and the battle yeah. had already been lost by all the time that the, the, the forces were marshaled kind of yeah. thing. Like it was yeah, just, yeah. it was... Um, so like the, the sort of third international politi- parties, the new communist parties across Europe very rapidly became reformist ones again. Yeah. Um, interesting point, as you say, where like by the time we get to like '68 in France, like mm. um, particularly the Communist Party in Italy and France were firmly constitutional actors. They sort of like declared their commitment to uh, the constitutional order of the various countries that they lived in, and had mm. done a great deal to shore it up. Yeah. Um, and participated in all sorts of elections and like and, 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 and rather not just elections but in coalition governments and the like. Mm. Um, the commun- communist party in uh, Italy, something I'd like to talk a lot more about. Um, sure. Good starting point would be the book. All I'm saying. Oh, okay. All I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I feel I feel like something that was kind of missing from this though was like an analysis of. Um, much more exploited countries, right? Yeah. And about um, kind of like revolutionary aims and strategies in those countries and what can be done that can't be done in um, wealthier, more exploitative countries versus kind of like the opposite of that, right? Yeah. Um, this was very much a like, what can we do in Europe and in the United States to bring about socialism? Um, but I, yeah, I suppose I'm not too sure. I suppose all of the questions that he raises still apply yeah um it's just about how you answer them i suppose depending on your setting yeah 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 you yeah that's not something that I, that's something i hadn't thought about mm-hmm. um the total absence of discussion of anti-colonial struggles mm. for want of a better phrase i suppose mm. and clearly a sort of insurrectionary repertoire of techniques yeah perhaps more applicable sure but then again like the whole framing for this di- distinction is predicated on the prior existence of sort of bourgeois political norms almost, I think, in sure. this book. Sure, um, yeah, yeah. So I guess that's the first thing that you look to kind of thing. Mm. Are there, are those political norms in place? Mm. Um, or even how do the political norms of the colo- co- co- colonial countries 
by by which I mean I don't know if that's the right word by which I mean the kind of like wealthy or more exploitative countries yeah. apply to the governments of um, the poorer countries, right? Because like when he talks about conservative backlash, you know, conservative backlash after the Paris Commune was like killing a good number of people, but also just like sending a lot of them to like New Caledonia. You know what I mean? Conservative backlash in say um, Indonesia or in uh, well, actually, Indonesia would be a really good example. It is like seven figures of people who die. And that conservative backlash is often fought on at the behest of uh, the wealthier countries. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's just, it was just something that I thought of briefly as we ended it, just about like how these questions apply. Again, like what we were saying about Leninism, like how would Leninism apply anywhere? How would these questions be applied um, in different uh, spatio-temporal uh, relationships I don't know places <laughs> in the warp in the warp yeah what would corn do about this I mean Zinch whoa <laughs> sorry we've already named our patron god if you were to map the four chaos gods <laughs> onto the political the compass four, yeah <laughs> okay I'm putting down the book Zinch obviously we know is like top left because there, there are some that, no there, is that true That's there, true. there are some of the there are some of these diagrams already depicted on the internet. Really? Okay. My terminology is terrible. It's on the uh, <laughs> internet? <laughs> um, uh, Zinch actually might be bottom left, libertarian left. He, uh, uh, yeah, think? yeah, I think, I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think, okay, I think this is what I've decided, right? I think I've decided. <laughs> Dan is drawing I'm, draw- I'm drawing, I'm going to do the little, I'm doing the little, oh shit, that's Slanesh. Uh, this oh, something no. like that. Okay, I don't know. Siege. <laughs> that looks. That looks. What you just drew looks like a hammer and sickle. That's kind of right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Slanesh yeah, and Siege. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god. Um, libertarian right. Slanesh. Yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Age of consent. Slanesh. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is where it gets a bit more difficult. You sure, the top quadrants. Yeah. The the the. So the we, historical association between the authoritarian left and famine uh, might um, might suggest that like Nurgle, Nurgle the classic option. Interesting. Um, and blood for the blood god. Blood, authoritarian blood, blood Margaret Thatcher, for, right? Blood for Margaret Thatcher. I, you know what? I might say I think Corn should maybe go on the top left. Yeah. Just for the purely revolutionary adventurism, and <laughs> just because the kind of like decaying corpse that was margaret thatcher when she was still alive and yeah like ronald reagan might be an article. yeah 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 <laughs> just rot just pure decay of institutional uh-huh, institutional uh-huh, decay uh-huh. they're this. a collection of very syphilitic characters <laughs> okay i'm i'm swapping them over <laughs> corn authoritarian mm. left <laughs> nurgle authoritarian right um that wasn't in the Miller Band. There we go. There it's definitive. Go, it's it is decided. Definitive. <laughs> Excellent. I'll, uh, we should make a graphic of that, accompany it with the episode. Yeah. Just so everybody knows. <laughs> um, I will I will stand by um, Zinch being the patron god of communism, but also uh, Korn is just the, he's just the coolest. Okay. I understand okay, why people okay. like Nurgle. I get that. but Sure. So this is also why we want Korn to be on the left. Yes. <laughs> um, so that when whenever we have our sort of like fleeting moments where we entertain the possibility of some kind of authoritarianism, so Stalinism, of some kind. we some amount of some degree of Stalinism. Um, hey, this might be the episode when you have to come out as a Stalinist. No, the, uh, you know what? Like you, your, your affinity um, with corn for for the blood god. Yes, um, interesting. There might not be any other option for you. Interesting. Interesting. What did I call myself last week? It was a... Uh, a primitivist? A primitivist. Yeah, there was something before primitivist, though. I forget what it was. Oh, well. A no-dig primitivist? No-dig. <laughs> I think I was like a... Some sort the of ultimate like, primitivism. Yeah. Some sort of like... No tell. True level of primitivist. We want to go back before the plow. Yeah. <laughs> that was the fall of civilization. <laughs> or the fall of humanity, rather. The great than the fall was the plow. <laughs> Is that is that is that technological determinism? What is technological determinism <laughs> these days? It's the effing plow. Hmm. Yeah, we got that sorted. Yeah. Hmm. We... Oh, I know what I was. I was a Maoist, primitivist, true leveler. Okay. I'm still kind of stand by. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> the long march. Indeed. Through the historic rights of way of Britain. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um. Well, Dan, 
Marxism and politics. Look at that. The the book that birthed the show. <laughs> the book that kept us going for this is the fifth sixth episode. Uh-huh. Six episodes we got out of this goddamn two hundred page. Yeah, book. if you count the introduction, but I don't sure. know whether the introduction counts as an episode at all. That was a bit of faff. Yeah. Mm. Um It's a bit of fun. Bit of fun faff. Say that. I'll say everybody. A palava. It's a palava of faff. <laughs> um, pick up this damn book. I don't know how you can, especially if you don't live in the UK, but um, pick it up. It rocks. There's PDFs of it everywhere. People. Yeah, go on, go on, go on that internet thing, mm. which I clearly don't understand. <laughs> the net. Go yeah. on the net. Double, 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 you don't. <laughs> Well, HTTP key, colon slash slash <laughs> www.libcom.com <laughs> um, I'm trying to think if I have any closing thoughts on this. I, I think, yeah, I think, well, I, I mean, he ends yes. um, with a sort of discussion of some of the implications of the strategy of the dictatorship of the proletariat mm-hmm. and um, the... The association with, well, well, one thing that I'd really quite like to mention actually because it, it feels it, it was I, it sort of struck me as being quite interesting is he really he really disagrees with um, Lenin's assertion that the 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 insurrection as he imagines it happening in something like State and Revolution in the book State and Revolution. <laughs> um, and the ensuing kind of dismantling and smashing of the bourgeois state automatically leads to what Marx called the dictatorship of the proletariat. Mm, mm. And um, Miliband, by looking at history and by identifying the fact that whenever you basically, whenever you destroy a... Um, he's suggesting that if you were to just destroy a state apparatus, basically you're just going to leave a void for another state apparatus to have to fill its place. Mm. Um, and the question of who is going to do the work of directing this mm. formation of this new uh, uh, state, this new um, sort of arrangement, I don't know, this new state arrangement, I suppose, it's he he draws up this dichotomy between um, the the direction which is, is sort of like put into the process by the revolutionary party, I suppose, or by whatever agents come to fill the sort of like power vacuum that's been uh, opened up by the revolutionary dismantling of the state. He he distinguishes that form of direction from democracy. Mm. And suggest that it's a very sort of undemocratic outcome, which is going to ensue from any sure. kind of insurrectionary revolutionary process. And he kind of suggests that, in actual fact, it is a um, peaceful electoral transition, which actually has the best opportunity of instituting the dictatorship of the proletariat mm. or beginning the transition toward the dictatorship of the proletariat, um, which. It's quite a tantalizing assertion, which then he sort mm. of pulls away from quite quickly and doesn't really go very far with. It's a band. <laughs> he sort of like, rather what he does is transition towards um, talking about all the problems that might face a mm. an effort to reform, radically reform away capitalism and institute socialism. Sure. Um, but he ends with this assertion that we ought, above all else, defend the the rights afforded us by bourgeois democracy sure. but seek to extend them and universalize them sure so i guess miliband very firmly putting himself in the sort of like reformist marxist camp as he has described mm. it kind of thing mm. um he did it he came <laughs> down on something yeah it's good yeah. good for him god bless him uh <laughs> Uh, in a book that we will read in the future, mm-hmm. this question is uh, 
answered, not maybe not answered, but discussed in a really different, unique way. And it puts it as much more of the proletariat, all of this stuff is much more of an economic question than an organizational one. Mm -hmm. um, so interested to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll refrain in t from commenting further until I finish the book. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I still need to purchase said book. Yeah. So it might be a little while, but that'd be really, but that, that might be the answer to this question of mm -hmm. like, how could you institute the dictatorship of the proletariat mm. from the starting point of a democratic mm. or a non-insurrectionary assumption of power by sure. some kind like of movement communists or socialists yeah 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 and it has quite a lot to do with uh, i think abolishing wage labor in any form even don't want to say anything crazy controversial here but even as the form that it existed on under the soviet union yeah um so yeah, economic question, perhaps. I think I think that I'll leave that little cliffhanger until I actually understand what's going on, and um, until we actually talk about that book. We tease a lot of books. This is a different book. This is the same book. This is the same book. This is a B book. It's a book. Yeah, it is a book. Um, should I just because I'd like to see Mountain Style? Yeah. May I read the last two sentences? Please, it would be more. It took, it took me a while to kind of realize how I felt about these last two sentences. I don't know if I was just expecting a banger. Uh huh. But, yeah. Well, um, this is the problem with a book that doesn't end with a conclusion. Like, yeah, exactly. There isn't a concluding chapter. It's just like it's like I agree. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so the last two sentences of um, God Emperor Ralph Miliband's book. But the civic freedoms which, however inadequately and precariously, form part of bourgeois democracy are the product of centuries of unremitting popular struggles. The task of Marxist politics is to defend these freedoms and to make possible their extension and enlargement by the removal of their class boundaries. Yeah, I felt a little weird after reading that. I mean, I agree now that I'm like, you know, kind of like I've soaked it up a bit more. Um, I think it's key where he says part of Marxist politics is to defend as well as to kind of like advance, right? Because there is a constant, obviously, a constant um, conflict between forces of progress and forces of um, not progress, conservatism, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, framing it just as he did there of there needs to be an advancement, but always be on the lookout, I guess, too, you know? Um, yeah, it's difficult. There's, there's the, there is the, it conflicts with the desire we might have to like mm. ruthlessly criticize yeah. the capitalist regime under which we live. Exactly. Um, to also sort of wonder whether the freedoms that, that it affords us mm. aren't important and not necessarily something to be jettisoned sure. willy nilly. Willy nilly. I mean, it's the same, <laughs> it's the same thing as looking at capitalist production, right? Because you, you know, as a commie, I'd love to be like, it sucks completely. It's horrible. It does nothing for anybody. But, you know, there is a reason. And we've talked about how we actually feel about this happening. So we're not saying this is a good thing. But there's a reason you can go and get strawberries in the supermarket any time of the year. Mm -hmm. There's a reason that there's like, at least for a minority of the people on the planet, so much excess. And we should be looking not to just relentlessly be like, it all sucks, get rid of all of it. But in the political question, as well as the economic question... Um, and production and everything what can we take from this mode and i think that's kind of what marx was trying to say was like yeah. capitalism sucks bro yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but at the same time like it is a process of building on top of this to get to socialism and it's not a complete jettisoning it's what can we take you know this is good stuff we'll build on this yeah i wonder if it's kind of like a philosophical question like mm. or a historic one i suppose things only emerge from the historic circumstances which sure. predate them kind of thing mm. Um, do things emerge sort of like totally from nowhere or, ah. like, <laughs> <laughs> or quite we can only it's only a uh, mm. yeah yeah mm. yeah socialism emergent from capitalism <laughs> do I stand by that? I don't know we'll find stand out by something. we'll find out we'll find out I think when we get to the book we'll see these days. A, a book <laughs> when we get to a book we'll see um, I feel like we should do something but there's nothing to be done that was the book uh -huh. It was good. Uh -huh. <laughs> Maybe we can like put in some post production effects. Yeah. <laughs> Fireworks. <laughs> <and that>. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know what? Let's have a Hall of Fame. I'm, let's do it right now, deciding it every once in a while. This isn't something we can give to everything, but let's just say from now on, so we can't retroactively give this anything, let's put this on our Hall of Fame. Hall Ralph Miller, Marxism, Fame, okay. Fame okay. politics. Okay. 
Um, how often? Okay, we we need to work out some ground rules for the whole time. <laughs> I mean, if we did it, it started with episode twenty. We'd be like every anarchist text we read. I'd be like, book it, put them on the shelf. <laughs> But I mean, like, is it, is it, is it a yearly entrant? It, it, I think a whenever a, entrant, something like... really, really, it's it can be whenever, but when something really, you know, really, you know what I'm saying? Okay. okay. <laughs> He's gesturing at me. Ah! <laughs> when, that, when it really got yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And does it, does when you get a lot of content out of like, it. Presumably, with other Halls of Fame, okay. a certain amount of time has to pass, elapse before people are admitted. Yes, and don't get me started on the Baseball Hall of Fame. Okay. It's the stupidest <laughs> thing on the planet. Okay, okay, okay. But this is 25 episodes since we first encountered this book. Oh, sure. I, so see, what you, oh, I of, see what you plenty mean. Plenty of time has passed. We can't, like, yeah. we can't put book, book Chin in <laughs> until we get okay, to like, right. episode... Until we read the anti-book 40 or 56? <laughs> okay, like, I agree. Um, Barry Bonds should be in the Hall of Fame, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, we could we could pair every one that we enter into the, <laughs> the, the auxiliary statements hall of fame with a baseball player if you like. Ooh, Ralph Miliband. I don't know if he would be Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds. Um, we'll call him uh, maybe someone like he's not in the hall of fame, but he will be. Maybe someone like CC Sabathia. Just like right on, man. Okay. Maybe you know what? Actually, he's a Pedro Martinez, and that's going to piss off a lot of people from New York who like Ralph Miliband. But come on, you got to love Pedro Martinez. Come on. <laughs> This is, I, you know, I don't have any love for Boston, but like, you know, pitcher Martinez, come on, the guy could pitch. Um, just kidding, I love Boston. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> I enjoyed that very much. I have no idea what any of it meant. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's all shall good stuff. We, shall we um, call a stop? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, think that, I think that might be a good idea. And then ceremonious ending to yes. a uh, very ceremonious moment. Dan and I will be burning this book now, so no one else can read it. Viking funeral. Um, all right uh, thank you again Ralph Miliband for spawning us you two beautiful boys and this has been Auxiliary Statements thank you all for listening 25 episodes most of them Ralph Miliband it's done the music you heard this episode was music to kill bad people too by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard if you like this song, you can check it out and much, much more on their Bandcamp at kinggizzard.bandcamp.com. Be sure and follow us up on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you like what you heard, be sure and tune in next week for some more commie discussion. Till next time.